Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the channel. If you're enjoying my content, many of you are not subscribed and many of you are not liking. So if you could, please just hit that thumb button and that and ring that bell and subscribe because it helps out so much. There's tons of people that are finding this content and it seems that they're really liking it. They're engaging with it. They're sticking around for, for long periods of time to be able to hear these amazing theologians and philosophers. Um, and if you like and subscribe, that will only help out even more for more people to find um, these videos and ultimately to find these answers. So today I have another video of Dr. Peter Kreft or Kreeft. I heard Jordan Peterson in a recent video refer to him as Dr. Peter Kreeft. So that's probably the right way to say it. But I've always been saying it as Dr. Kreft. So I guess I'll go with the one that seems right to me. I don't know. Uh, so in this video, Dr. Peter Kreft is unpacking the, the book of Job. And what he's doing is he's providing an ancient answer to modern problems. What is the problem? It is the problem of evil. Now, it's not specifically the logical problem of evil that likes to deal with this idea of a that God cannot exist because if an all-loving God did exist, he wouldn't allow for evil. It's more asking the question, why do bad things happen to good people? And I think this is a really interesting question that many of us deal with. For example, when the plane crashes, why did God in his providence or in determinism, if you're a religious here, why wasn't there a bad person on the plane instead of the good people, for example, is a way to think about this problem. So it's a modern problem. It has an ancient answer that's found in the book of Job. Now, I know there's lots of you that are watching that are maybe not religious. Uh, you came to hear, maybe you're atheist and you like philosophy and you came to hear this philosopher. I just wanna remind us that it is impossible to separate theology and philosophy. And the reason that is the case is because all of philosophy, its foundations and the pre-Socratics and even before that, they all had a religious worldview. It was pagan, mind you, but it was still a religious worldview. Even the atheist secular philosophers, the postmodern philosophers of modernity, they are still working with those fundamental concepts and ideas. So it's impossible to separate the two. So much of what you're going to hear in this ancient answer to this modern problem is a religious response. But just know that it's impossible to separate the two. And in the way that Dr. Peter Kreft analyzes the book of Job here, it has practical benefit for both sides. Now, obviously, I believe that it is the word of God. I believe that the book of Job was put there by God so that we would have these answers. But I think if you don't believe in God, you can still heed and you can still find much practical benefit from this video. All right, let's watch and see what Dr. Peter Kreft has to say. The overall story is well known. Job is a good and righteous man who suffers apparently meaninglessly and apparently unjustly, and his faith is severely tested. Uh, he comes close to the edge, but he preserves in his faith in the end uh, and is justly rewarded. That's true. That's the plot. Uh, and therefore, the beginning and the ending is the most interesting part, the dramatic part. Uh, most of the poetry in between is to the modern mind uh, rather boring and repetitious because the modern mind doesn't like poetry very much. Our poets are usually self-indulgent uh, uh, aesthetes who talk to each other uh, in unintelligible ways. Uh, and poetry is not a popular occupation in our society as it has been in almost every other society in history. So the poetic sections are uh, not the modern cup of tea, but the philosophical and theological sections are, and that's what I'm going to emphasize. So we begin at the beginning. There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job, and that man was blameless and upright, one who feared God and turned away from evil. Now you have to accept the author's presupposition. It's very easy to take the three friends point of view and say, well, if God is just, there must be some reason for God permitting these horrible things to happen to Job. He must have deserved it. Uh, there must be some hidden sin there. That seems reasonable, but it's not true. Here's data. Job is a saint. Job does not deserve the stuff that he's going to receive. So why does he receive it? By the way, it's unknown whether there was a Job or not, whether the book is totally fictional 
uh, or whether there was a Job. The land of Uz is, uh, I believe, not mentioned anywhere else in the Bible. That doesn't mean it doesn't exist. But it doesn't matter because there are many people who are very much like Job. Millions of them. Many of them are saints. Saints, by definition, are good. Saints suffer enormously. They don't deserve it. Why do they suffer? Why do bad things happen to good people? Rabbi Kushner's book title, very good title, to a not very satisfying book, but a very honest book. Well, the book is written in a mythic form, a larger-than-life form, which is not to be taken literally, I think, like the creation story. The creation story is true and historical. There was an Adam and an Eve, but whether it was an apple, whether it was a literal fruit, whether there was a literal talking snake, uh, whether God literally walked hand in hand with Adam and Eve in the garden before the fall or not, is not important. Uh, the things symbolized by these mythic symbols are the point that the author is trying to get across. So this is truth, but not literal scientific truth, I think. So we have uh, a kind of interview in heaven between God and Satan. The word Satan means the accuser or the enemy. Uh, Satan is the enemy of God. He can't conquer God, but he's also the enemy of us, and he can conquer us. Now, there was a day when the sons of God, angels, came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came among them. And the Lord said to Satan, where have you come from? And Satan answered, from going back and forth on the earth and from walking up and down on it. It's his world. It's a fallen world. He is called the prince of this world. And the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man who fears God and turns away from evil? In other words, God and the author of Job say exactly the same thing in exactly the same words. So that's our data. That's unquestionable. Job is a saint. Job does not deserve punishment. He deserves reward. And Satan answers the Lord, does Job fear God for nothing? In other words, what's his motive? Job's got everything. Got a lot of kids, which in all ancient societies is a blessing, not a fear. There are many ways in which our society is radically at odds with every society in the history of the world until ours. That's one of them. He has uh, riches. He has oxen and uh, donkeys and sheep and, and cattle and servants all over the place. He's got everything. He deserves them. And he has not misused him, and they have not tempted him. Uh, he's, he's perfect. But Satan says, what is, God's, what is Job's motive? He says to God, have you not put a hedge around him in his house and all that he has on every side? You have blessed the work of his hands, and his possessions have increased in the land. But put forth your hand now and touch all that he has, and he will curse you to your face. In other words, you're a happy, good, spoiled kid, and Santa Claus comes down the chimney with a lot of presents every year. Well, this year, Santa's going to come down without any presents, and we'll find out whether he loves Santa or his presents. Does he love you for your own sake, or does he love you for all your gifts? There's only one way to find out. Take away all the gifts. And God consents to that. Not because God's stupid and doesn't know what's going to happen, not because God's a scientist and is performing an experiment in order to get a result that he doesn't know beforehand. Of course not. He's doing this for Job's sake. He's not going to do anything for Satan's sake. And he's not going to do it for his own sake because he already knows. So it must be out of God's love of Job that God allows Satan to torture Job. That may be shocking, but that's the only possible interpretation of what's going on here. So the Lord said to Satan, Behold, all that he has is in your power. Only upon himself do not put forth your hand. You can take his possessions, but you can't take himself. You can't kill him. You can't take his body. That's very significant. God is in total control. Satan is his instrument. Satan is the wild beast at the end of God's line, like a, like a mad dog. And God is holding the leash. And he says to Satan, you can go this far, but no further. Satan is not in control. God is in control. That's another piece of data. So he loses everything. 
all his possessions, all his servants are murdered, uh, his children uh, are feasting in a house and a hurricane comes and the roof collapses and they all die. Now he's got nothing left. And what's his answer? What's Job's response to this? Job tore his robe and shaved his head and fell upon the ground and worshiped. And he said, naked I came from my mother's womb, naked I shall return. The Lord has given, the Lord has taken away, blessed be the name of the Lord. Well, I wouldn't have said that. I would have screamed because I'm not a saint. Job is. So Job passes the test. In all this, Job did not sin or charge God with wrong. He did not say, God, I'm better than you are. I believe in justice, you don't. You made a mistake. Job doesn't say that. Very impressive. So he passes the first test and Satan comes back and says, uh, yeah, you won't pass the second test. Put forth your hand now and touch his bone and flesh and he'll curse you to your face. Why is physical suffering harder to endure than mental suffering? Well, because it's like a tyrant with a whip saying, look at me, look at me, look at me. It's almost impossible to focus on anything except your pain when you're in tremendous pain. So it happens. Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord, afflicted Job with loathsome sores from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head. And he put, took a potsherd with which to scrape himself and sat among the ashes. The Hebrew word translated here, ashes, means dung. It's the S word. His wife is still alive, but his wife is more of a problem than a help. Look what his wife said to him. Do you still hold fast to your integrity? Curse God and die. He said to her, you speak as one of those foolish women would speak. Shall we receive only good at the hand of God and not also evil? And in all this, God, Job did not sin with his lips. Much harder to suffer in your body than just in your soul. Much harder to suffer the loss of those that you love by death or betrayal, as Job did, than simply to suffer for yourself. Job, Job everything is taken away from Job. And when his three friends came to comfort him, they did not recognize him. He was so disfigured. These three friends are not bad people. They're mistaken. They're not very good psychologists. They lack sympathy. Uh, but they're sincere, and they're honest, and they're believers. And they care about Job. They're, they're astonished by Job's sufferings. They raised their voices and wept, and they tore their robes and sprinkled dust upon their heads. And they sat with him on the ground seven days and nights, and no one spoke a word to him, for they saw how great his suffering was. All right, now, Job opened his mouth, and the first thing he does is he curses. But he doesn't curse God. He curses the day of his birth. He asks for death. He longs for those who long for death, but it comes not. They dig for it more than for hidden treasures. Death is not so bad. Pain is much worse than death. Euthanasia is a great temptation. It's wrong. It's absolutely wrong. Life is an intrinsic good, and we are not the authors of life, but uh, I think we have to be very sympathetic to those who are in such intense pain that they, they ask for death as a blessing. And that's Job. He's not going to kill himself, but he says, God, please take my life away. I simply cannot take it. He's, there are limits. Look at what he says. When I lie down, I say, when shall I arise? But the night is too long, and I am full of tossing until the dawn. If you're in pain, you can't sleep, and you wait till you awake. And then, when you awake, you want to sleep. There's no way out for Job. Sleeping is not an answer. Waking is not an answer. Death is the only answer, and God won't give him that. And we have to be at least as sympathetic as the three friends to Job. And I think all of us, or almost all of us, have known somebody who is in such terrible pain and such terrible agony that they sincerely believe that they simply cannot endure it. 
Which, which of us can identify with Job? Which of us is, is that strong? Uh, a prayer that I, I find very honest is, uh, God, you know I'm so weak that uh, uh, if you're going to make me a saint, please do it very slowly and very gradually because I can't take the treatment you gave to Job and so many of the other saints. The three friends always speak correct theology. They don't deny God's goodness, God's justice. They're right about God. Or are they? Uh, Job is the one who flirts with doubt. He doesn't quite take that leap out of his faith into lived doubt. God, you're wrong. I'm right. But he, he's tempted to do it. In fact, at one point, he says, uh, I wish we could go to court together, God, you and me. And if there was an impartial judge, he would judge me to be innocent and you to be guilty. Me to be just and you to be unjust. But there is no such impartial judge. You're the judge, so that's just a fantasy of mine. And he doesn't live or believe that fantasy, but he's got it. That's, that's a very deep temptation. He says, I take my stand on my integrity. Well, Job has integrity. God himself admits that when he says to the devil, he's an upright man. But to take your stand on your integrity, that's the wrong foundation. Back in the 1970s, I think, there was a candidate for president from the state of Maine named Ed Muskie, who was a Democrat, and he was campaigning in Iowa, which is largely Republican, and he was out in a cornfield, and they forgot to bring him a platform, and there were thousands of people in the audience, so he had to climb over their heads to something tall to be seen. And the only thing that he saw was uh, some sort of uh, machine in the cornfields, so he said, let me get on that. And they told him, uh, well, that's a, that's a manure spreader. And he said, well, that's okay, uh, but this is the first time in my life that I'm going to give a democratic speech for a Republican platform. Uh, the joke can work anyway, uh, the other way as well. But uh, the platform of your own integrity is a manure spreader. So Job's mistake, at least temporarily, is to, to have confidence in himself. And God is undermining that confidence. In the middle of his complaints and sufferings, he suddenly comes out with a remarkable statement of faith in chapter 19. Now, this is a very old book. Maybe it's the oldest one in the Bible. It's close to it. And it was written at a time when God had not clearly revealed life after death and the immortality of the soul to his chosen people. It was suggested but the confidence that each individual soul is immortal and will live forever, either in the presence of God or without it, uh, that was not clear at the time. Many Jews then believed it and many did not, just as today. Many Jews do believe in life after death. Orthodox Jews certainly do. Uh, Reformed Jews usually don't, and then conservative Jews are sort of in the middle. Uh, so in that context, it's remarkable how Job comes out with these words, uh, a faith that God will reward him after death and that there is immortality. I know that my Redeemer lives. God is the Redeemer, the Savior. The word Jesus means literally God saves. I know that my Redeemer lives and that at the last he will stand upon the earth and after my skin has been destroyed, then from my flesh I shall see God, whom I shall see on my side, and my eye shall behold him and not another's. That's a remarkable statement of faith. It's as if there are two people in Job, the one who can't stand his sufferings and longs for death and curses his life, and flirts with, God must have made a mistake, on the one hand, and the Job whose faith is so strong as to withstand that. And notice the actual words. Uh, From my flesh I shall see God, whom I shall see on my side. When God finally appears at the end, Job's response to him is, I had heard of you by the hearing of the ear, 
but now my eye sees you. The difference between Job's faith, which is invisible, you don't see God, and Job's reward, which is to see God face to face, something that God himself said, no man can do this and die. Moses was the only exception. Moses saw God face to face on Mount Sinai, and when he came down the mount, his face was so full of light that uh, he had to put a veil over it. The people were terrified by that divine light. And Job is rewarded at the end by the beatific vision, by seeing God face to face. And that's what he's hoping for here. He's anticipating that. That's a remarkable faith. When God finally does show up after all the arguments, and the arguments don't really go anywhere. All three friends, in only slightly different ways, say the same thing. Our premise is that God is perfect and that God is just. And that's a true premise. Our deduction from that is that you must deserve these sufferings because it would be unjust for God to give you these sufferings if you're such a saint. So you must have some sin that you're hiding from us and from God. Confess it, repent and maybe God will, in his mercy, reward you. That's reasonable. They say nothing except what is in the rest of the Bible. They lack compassion, they lack uh, good psychology, their bedside manner is terrible, but they're defending God. They're not doing right by Job, but they're apparently doing right by God. And when God shows up, he says about the three friends and about Job something astonishing. The Lord said to Eliphaz the Temanite, the first of the three friends, my wrath is kindled against you and against your two friends, for you have not spoken of me what is right as my servant Job has. That's puzzling. In any book, but especially in scripture, focus on the things you don't understand, the mysterious things. They're like bushes where the, the game is hiding. You already know the stuff that's out in the clearing, full of light. But you come across something like this, what could that possibly mean? You might not get an answer to it, but it's certainly worth pursuing. And if you're honest, you want, you want to find that, that game that's hiding. The three friends said, God is great and God is good. Let us thank him for our food. Amen. That's, that's all they did. Their poetry wasn't as good as Job's, but their theology was apparently right. Job, however, flirted with heresy. He confesses that. He says, uh, my words are wild because my sufferings are more than I can bear. So why in the world does God approve Job's wild words and not the three friends perfectly correct and proper and true and orthodox words? Is God himself a heretic? Martin Buber, one of the greatest rabbis of modern times, uh, in one of his books, uh, answers that question. And he says, the reason is because Job prayed. He spoke to God in an I-thou relationship. God was his thou. Throughout his life, he was already face to face with God. The three friends never prayed. They just theologized. Their theology was proper. Their Philosophical arguments were strong and good. So it's not the content, it's the context. They never talked to God, they talked about him as if he was absent. Stupid parents sometimes do that uh, to their children. What are we going to do about Jane? Or what are we going to do about Jack? Uh, uh, he's, she's sassing us all the time and he's, he's, he's flunking his courses and he's got bad friends. Hey, mom, dad, I'm here. Hello? Give me the respect of talking to me face to face, please. God is present, not absent. God is not out there. You don't need a long distance call to get to him. He is, as Augustine says, more intimately present to me than I am to myself. And the three friends talked about him as if he was absent. And Job, despite what he said, at least talked to him. That's what God wants. Well, when God shows up, he doesn't say what the three friends say. 
he says, well, he says, chapter 38. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind. Who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Who are you, Job? Gird up your loins like a man. Now I will question you and you shall declare to me. Ah, that's Job's mistake. Job thought God was the answer man. And Job was the one with questions. Uh-uh, exactly the opposite. God is the one who is questioning us. And we have to give the answer by our life, by our response, by our fidelity or infidelity, by our faith or our loss of faith. I will now question you and you shall declare to me. That's the real relationship between all of us and God. In everything that happens in our life, God is questioning us, testing us, sculpting us. So God asks Job a very reasonable question and it shows a divine sense of humor. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you must know. On what were its bases sunk? Who laid its cornerstones? When the morning stars sang together and all the angels of God shouted for joy. Were you there? I didn't notice you there giving me advice, Job. Are you the writer of the story of your life? Or are you a character in the story? If you're a character in the story, then I'm the writer. I, the perfect God, who surround your life with my wisdom. You don't surround me with your wisdom. I am not an ingredient in your religious experience. You are an ingredient in my religious experience. My name is I. Your name is thou. You're reversing that. Will you put me in the wrong so that you may be put in the right? And God talks about two monsters, Leviathan and Behemoth. Perhaps uh, uh, the crocodile, uh, perhaps uh, the hippopotamus. Uh, monsters. Can you conquer these monsters? Well, we have monsters in our lives. Job has monsters invading his life, uh, inspired by Satan. Uh, not by God. God permits it, but God does not create it. He allows it. Why does he allow terrible sufferings and injustices? Why, why are behemoth and leviathan parts of God's plan? We don't know. That's the definitive answer that God himself gives to the problem of evil. We cannot solve it. We don't know. We're not God. We just have to trust him. We can't figure it out. No one will ever solve the problem of evil this side of heaven. Job finally realizes that. And he says to God two things. He knows that only two things that are absolutely necessary to know. Augustine has a, 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 a meditation where he imagines God talking to him and saying, hey, Augustine, uh, what do you want to know? I know everything. I'll tell you anything you want. And Augustus says, I only want the answer to two questions. Only two questions, says God? Yep, only two questions. What are they? Well, I want to know who you are, and I want to know who I am. Because those are the only two people that I can never, ever escape for a single second in time or in eternity. And God said, that's very wise, Augustine. You've asked the, the right questions. And here, Job gets the answer to those two most important questions in the world. First, who God is. Second, who he is. First, I know that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. And then he quotes his own foolish words. Excuse me. First, he quotes God's wise words. Then he quotes his foolish words. God's wise words are, who is this that hides counsel without knowledge? Who do you think you are, Job? And Job says, I have uttered what I did not understand, things too wonderful for me, which I did not know. And then Job quotes his own foolish words, not a sin, but a folly. Hear and I will speak. I will question you and you declare to me. That's what Job said to God. God, be, be my answer man. Be my Santa Claus, give me presents again, or at least an explanation for why you took him away. And that's the wrong relationship. 
God says to us, hear, and I will speak. God says to us, I will question you, and you shall answer me. And then I think the key verse in the whole book of Job that explains why Job is satisfied now. He hasn't gotten his stuff back. God will give him his stuff back. He gets uh, the loyalty of his wife. He gets uh, another big family. He gets his uh, possessions, his animals, his servants, everything. But before he gets anything back, he's still on the dung heap. He says, why is he satisfied? Here's why. I had heard about you by the hearing of the ear, second hand. Now my eye sees you. First hand knowledge, not second hand knowledge. Therefore, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. The three friends tried to get him to repent of sin, but there's no great sin that Job committed that he has to repent of. He repents of his foolishness, of his demand for an answer. We do not have an answer. God, in his wisdom and love, has not given us a clear answer to why the righteous suffer. His answer is himself. And it comes definitively in the New Testament when Christ on the cross stretched out his arms and legs to embrace everybody and everything and gave everything, every single drop of his blood, all 12 pints of it. He could have redeemed the whole world with a single drop at the circumcision but he gave all of his body and all of his blood. Why? Because that's what love does. And that's the definitive answer to what is God doing? He is giving us gifts. Taking away Job's gifts was a gift. Suffering is a gift. Blessed Fulton Sheen said, don't waste your suffering. Suffering has power. Faith has power. Suffering can have power to create courage even without faith, but put faith and suffering together and you get the greatest, the greatest power in the history of the world. What Christ's faith in his Father's love, which was severely tested in Gethsemane and on the cross, what that did was to redeem the world. And we have the incredible privilege of participating in that terrifying, tough, and mysterious love. We don't have answers, but we have the answerer. And he lived among us for 33 years. And his promise is, I will be with you always until the end of the world. Jesus Christ is the supreme answer to the problem of evil. And there you are. God bless you. Jesus is the supreme answer to the problem of evil. Wow. That was one of the best theodicies I have ever heard. And I think it really gets to the heart of the matter. The entire time when he was talking, my mind was just going to this phrase, Jesus is our Job. Jesus is our Job. Because Job is a saint that does, does not deserve evil. Jesus is proper God, Yahweh, and he didn't deserve evil. Yet he came into the world as a babe, lived a perfect sinless life, and then sacrificed and died on the cross, the most heinous evil that could possibly be imagined. And he endured it. You see, Job did not get what he, uh, Job got what he did not deserve. He received what he did not deserve, mainly the sin of the world. And yet he did that for us in our place. Remember this verse, and hopefully you can see it. It's in First Peter. Um, I'm the reference is escaping me. Maybe I could find it here real quick. First Peter 2, 22 and 23, which says, He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to God. That's my paraphrase. It says, he continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. The ultimate reality that we all have to deal with is the fact that we all have evil in our heart. And how in the world are we going to deal with it? How are we going to get the sin out of us, to put it very bluntly? And the answer is Jesus Christ of Nazareth, who died on the cross, rose again, and ascended to heaven. 
until we realize the fact that Jesus is our substitute, that Jesus died in our place, we can never have our sin taken care of. We can never have the evil out of us. That is the real problem of evil. Not why do good things happen to bad people, but why and how can a bad person like me become good? And that answer is found in Jesus Christ. All right, that's all I have for this video. Please be sure to like and subscribe. I hope you're enjoying this content. I'm really enjoying creating it for you guys. It's just been such a blessing to see the response. And I'm looking forward in the next weeks and in the next few days creating more videos for you. So please be sure to like and subscribe. I'll see you in the next one. Peace.